John Calvin said that the Lord God of heaven has given us two books to read. He's given us the book of his revealed word in Holy Scripture. But he's also given us the book of his world in the created order that he has put in place and that he upholds each day by his mighty providential word. And Calvin says we are to be scholars of both books. Uh, Yes, we are to immerse ourselves, obviously, in the words of Holy Scripture because it is the gospel. It is the message of hope and salvation through Jesus Christ, God's only Son sent into our world for our deliverance. But we're also to make it our business to understand the world in which we live and to understand those around us in the world, even those who are against us and who strongly disagree with us, to understand what's going on in their thought processes and in the things that they say. There is one individual um, who died at the age of 49 um, uh, back at the, the end of the 1970s. Um, and he was a, a Cambridge lecturer, um, and, and his claim to fame is that, that he was the originator of a, um, what he called, somewhat cynically, uh, a trilogy in five parts under the title A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It began life as a, a radio broadcast uh, to a, a local audience in and around Cambridge, but then it captured people's attention, and, and Douglas Adams, who was its author, he... he um, he turned it into a book, and it then became a television series, and then it became, and then it became a, a movie. Um, and, and what makes it fascinating is that here's, here is um, a kind of allegorical story written by this man um, that gives his perspective on the meaning of the world, life, the universe, and everything. It's his attempt to make sense of this world and universe in which we live and that we are confronted with every day. He's humorous in the way that he writes and he goes through the biggest issues of life from um, the origins of life at the beginning through to what will happen at the end of life when, when this world, this universe as we know them comes to come to an end. But the tragedy of all that he goes through is that he concludes there are no answers to life. And he somewhat cynically says that the answer to the question of the world, the universe, and life and everything is 42. A random number. Which speaks of the the randomness of his own thinking in trying to make sense of what is clearly um, not a disordered universe, Um, but a world and universe and human life that is filled with meaning, purpose, order, and regularity. Otherwise, we could not face another day if that wasn't the case. In in some ways, what we we see um, in that particular individual's writing and commentary on the meaning of life is reflected here in the book of Daniel in, in the way that King Nebuchadnezzar, who is in the position of being the most powerful ruler on the face of the earth at that time. And he is an empire that has exceeded the limits of any previous empire that has come before. And and he finds himself wrestling with the question of how how do I make sense of this disparate realm over which I am the king? How how do I try to hold together uh, this multiplicity of peoples from different nations and different stations of life? And in that sense, what we're getting in this chapter is more than just a glimpse into ancient history as recorded by Daniel, but rather we're getting a timeless message about all of history. A message that's reinforced in Daniel chapter 7 whenever Daniel comes back to the same issue, not this time through a dream that the king was given, but um, through a revelation that he receives personally from God in heaven, but covering the same territory showing that God is not only the God of the past and of the present, but he is the Lord of the future. He is the God who who knows the end from the beginning because he has ordained the beginning through to the end. His hand and his purpose is woven through it all. The fact that these massive issues are addressed in a very personal way by one 
particular human being who happened to be the most powerful individual on planet Earth at that time only serves to show um, how much we share as human beings because what he wrestles with in macrocosm as the ruler over an empire, we all wrestle with in microcosm in our own little world, whether as families trying to bring up our children or as individuals trying to navigate our way through life. We are constantly finding ourselves asking the question, what's it all about? How am I supposed to navigate these confusing and conflicting waters in which I find myself? Let me seek to draw out some answers from the text um, using three questions that clearly were on the mind of the king, um, but I'm certain to a greater or lesser extent are on our minds also, perhaps on a daily basis. Here they are. How can I cope with anxiety? Where can I find certainty? And what am I to make of history? Where, how can I cope with anxiety? Where can I find certainty? And what am I to make of history? Let's try to answer them um, in uh, the minutes that follow. How can I cope with anxiety? Well, that comes out, I think, in, in verses 1 to 3 uh, in terms of, of the, the king and the way that he, he wrestles with the issues uh, that he is confronted with um, and the way in which he's troubled by dreams. We've already met this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, in the opening chapter. He is the king, as we reminded ourselves last week, um, who conquered uh, the, uh, the nation of Judah uh, in southern Israel and took its people into exile. Um, he he uh, devastated Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. Um, here was, the, uh, here was the, 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 an early example of, of Hitler's blitzkrieg warfare. Um, demolishing everything in his path, leaving um, a scorched earth behind him for the few who were left behind and people carried off into exile under the jurisdiction of the new king. And yet, amazingly, even though he was a man of such power and obviously of such, such um, wisdom and, and ability to plan, and to control and, and to establish this empire um, through the various levels of government he, he put in place. He was a man who was prone to anxiety. He was a man who had sleepless nights and who in particular was troubled by dreams. This burden of responsibility that weighs so heavily upon him um, robs him of the ability to sleep peacefully because he, he felt um, the responsibility that he carried on his shoulders. It's, it's not unusual for us as we have dreams during the hours of sleeping at night. We have dreams, we wake up perhaps in a cold sweat and a panic. We know we've been troubled by our dreams. Can we remember our dream? We can't remember our dream. Dreams have a strange ability to trouble us when we're asleep, but then vanish into the ether whenever we wake up. Uh, and even though we're, 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 we're not of the mind that says um, we need to interpret the dream, we need to understand what the dream is saying to us, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a reflection of, of what's going on in our subconscious rises to the surface in the hours of darkness. But for Nebuchadnezzar, it wasn't simply the fact that his sleep was disturbed and, and he, he wasn't get, getting his, his requisite eight hours of slumber, but rather in, in the world that he lived in, indeed, right back through many of the empires and civilizations that there were before him, and there, was this, there was this deep superstitious belief that dreams carried special meaning. Hence the intensity and the urgency of his desire to find an interpretation of this dream. He, he honestly believed that the gods were speaking to him. That this was a supernatural message coming to him from another world and, and he'd better understand what the message is all about. We see exactly the same thing in the book of Genesis and the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph himself was nicknamed a dreamer. Um, because he experienced dreams that, that were a preview of what God had planned for him uh, in his future as he grew up and where he would end up. 
Um, so too for Pharaoh, he had dreams. And, and they were dreams that deeply disturbed him as the one who was head over all of Egypt, which was a, a significant empire at that time. Um, and, and he wanted to know what these dreams meant. And Joseph was the one um, who eventually gave him that interpretation. That's exactly where Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy begins. A, a man... Um, who is the key figure in the plot line. His name is Arthur Dent. Um, and and uh, we, we meet this man in a state of panic, high anxiety, because his house is about to be demolished to make, by, make way for a bypass that's been constructed by the local roads authority. And he says, I'm worried. And it transpires in the next few paragraphs. He's always worried. He worries about everything. He's a man who is, uh, is paranoid about life. The fact that he's 30 and just moved out of London only adds to his anxieties getting used to a new environment. Here's a man for whom the pressures of life and the prospect of losing his home leaves him feeling extremely insecure. Uh, but the plot thickens, and, and this is where, um, uh, where Adams takes the thing to a, a, a wider level. Um, it transpires that, that the problem facing Arthur Dent is, is that it's actually the Earth that's about to be demolished. Planet Earth is about to be removed from the solar system to make way for what he calls an intergalactic highway. And in that sense, the security of the entire human race, not just its individual, but the, the entire human race is under threat with what's been planned from another universe. Adams could hardly have been closer to the mark as he expressed those concerns all those years ago uh, because he was living um, in the closing years of the Cold War. He was living at that time of history that you, many of, of, the, of us in the building can remember uh, whenever the threat of nuclear conflict was real, uh, whenever economic collapse was a real threat, inflation was running far higher than it's running at the moment, and, and people were, were filled with uncertainty about the future and what lay ahead for us all as a human race. But it doesn't have to be those big issues of life that trouble us. We can be worried about our work. We can be worried about school, university. We can worry, be worried about our friends or lack of them. We can be worried about our pension and our preparation for retirement if we're nearing that stage of life. Our health, the list goes on and on. But, but in that sense, when we stop and think about the things that trouble us and rob us of sleep and cause us anxiety in life, we're not that unlike King Nebuchadnezzar. Whether you're the king on the throne of an empire or whether you're an ordinary individual like us, in our homes going about our daily business, the troubles of life descend upon us and we realize that in ourselves we do not have the answers and we are not equal and we often are not able to cope with these things. But the question for the king and the question for us is this, where do we turn when we are overwhelmed by anxiety and fear? And, and his instinctive reaction was to look to magicians and, and, and enchanters and astrologers, or so we are told. People who claimed understanding of the times and claimed the ability to act as guides in making decisions in the face of these uncertainties. In one sense, we might sneer at that kind of superstition that prevailed in an ancient world, a less sophisticated world than ours. But it's an even stranger thing that that superstition persists so deeply, so deeply in our world today. The very fact that so many newspapers still run a horoscope section for people to consult, to be able to consult the stars to see if there's any light to be shed on what they can expect tomorrow or next week or next month. And why do people turn to such means to try and get direction for the future? And the answer is this, because all people in all places struggle over a basic 
insecurity in their lives. The deep within the human psyche, we realize that we are not all sufficient in ourselves. And we realize very quickly, no matter many, how many safeguards we put around ourselves, no matter how careful we may be in trying to construct, construct a secure life and lifestyle, that things can strike from all unexpected angles that we haven't seen in advance or been able to prepare for in advance. And we cannot cover all the bases. That there is a fundamental insecurity in us because we are human. And we have our limitations. And that causes us to struggle. And that's not a bad thing. Because it's only when we are conscious of our limitations. It's only when we realize we can go thus far and no further. That there will always be things for which we are not the equal. That we will appreciate that if there's going to be help. To survive and to persevere. It cannot come from within ourselves. It cannot come from around us in the world to which we belong, it can only come from someone else who is above and beyond these struggles that weigh so heavily upon our souls. So that's the first question then. How can I cope with anxiety? Not by looking within, which is often the first place we look. We become introspective, morbidly introspective, but we look without. But it leads to a second question. Where can I find certainty? Verses 4 to 28. The fact that the king turns to this body of, of spiritual and astrological advisors um, uh, uh, who were part of his court. They were, they were part of his cabinet. You know, so you, you visit number 10. Um, if you happen to get a guided tour of number 10, you'll be able to take, go into the cabinet room. You see the famous coffin-shaped table. You're able to, to see where the various members of the cabinet sit around the prime minister. Um, and, and, and you see where the seat of government is in terms of cabinet responsibility um, and how that feeds through into parliament. But in reality, uh, the... the the seat of power lies somewhere else. He asked these people, these astrologers, um, not only for the meaning of the dream, that they might explain it to him, but he wanted to be told the dream to see if their credentials were for real. And, and his motives for, for doing this may have simply been because he had forgotten the dream. You know how often is the case you've dreamed a dream during the night and you wake up and you know you were troubled by it, but boy, can you remember what the dream was? Yes. You, you, you tell your wife or your husband, you I, I was awake tossing and turning last night after this terrible dream, and they say, what was it? I, said, I can't remember. And, and this may well have been the case for the king. But more likely, he responded to these men and consulted them because of his deep mistrust. So he said to them, I want you to tell me the dream first of all. And then tell me the meaning of the dream. There are no shortage of people who do a wonderful job of masquerading as, as experts in the various departments of life. Um, who, when actually consulted for their advice, we discover that they know very little. And they're not the experts they claim to be. But of course, when this kind of pressure was applied to these men, the, the truth about their powers, the genuineness of their powers was very quickly exposed and they were shown to be false. Yes, they made, themselves, they made great claims to be able to understand the realms of the unknowable. But when they were put to the test, they didn't have that knowledge. Despite their pleadings, their protests, they were actually seen for what they were. And again, that's no, no different from the so-called experts who wield such massive influence over so many spheres of life today. The one thing that every human being lacks in themselves is certainty. Because we, by nature, have limited knowledge and limited understanding. And we can go thus far and no further in terms of how we make sense of and how we deal with the various challenges that come our way in life. And it's only when their limits are exposed by those who put their faith in them that they will do as 
Nebuchadnezzar did, did and turned their, their backs, his back upon them. But the king wasn't interested in simply making scapegoats of these men. He, he wanted to annihilate every last one of them, to put them to death, to kill their families, and to raise their homes to the ground. They asked why they were to suffer this fate. They asked for time, verses 14 to 16. Um, and, and they asked, and, and then we are told in, in verses uh, 17 to 18 that um, Daniel, when he heard this news, asked that he and his friends be given time to pray. Daniel and his friends were drawn into this, unaware of, of the conversation that had been going on with their colleagues in this imperial cabinet that Nebuchadnezzar had established for himself. And, and when they realized that they were threatened now with the destruction of their lives and of their property, and the destruction of their property, they turned to God. Uh, despite their exceptional abilities, these young men had risen through the ranks at lightning speed. Um, they, they were the first to acknowledge their limits and their need to look to God and to depend upon God to make sense of what was happening around them and to give the advice and counsel for which they were being asked. And when God answered their prayer and, and, and revealed the dream first of all to them so that they in turn could reveal the dream to Nebuchadnezzar and then give the interpretation... Um, were, they, were, they, were they rubbing themselves on the lapels whenever Nebuchadnezzar praised them and, and thanked them for what had happened? No, they were pointing up to God and said, don't thank us, thank our God, the God of the Jews, whose temple you have raised to the ground. Thank him for making this revelation to you, despite what you've done to his holy house in Jerusalem. He made sure that God got the credit for the wisdom that they were given. And all they were doing was to declare that the only place that we can find absolute certainty about what's going on around us and within us and absolute certainty about what lies ahead of us in the unknown future of this world is from outside this fallen world. Yes, this world has expanded, our race has expanded in knowledge and understanding. Uh, we've just been told this past week that the original um, Large Hadron Collider that was constructed under the French Swiss border um, to, to discover the tiniest particles of matter that existed at the beginning of time through crashing um, uh, my, minute particles into each other, um, that that hasn't worked. And, and we're, we're now faced, the, or somebody's faced, with a, a, a bill of hundreds of billions of pounds to build an even deeper hole in the ground under the Swiss-French border uh, with an even bigger um, particle collider um, to try and understand how the universe began. And you want to tap these people on the shoulder and say, you, you know, you just pick up your Bible and read the first two chapters. That's how the universe began, we're told. Don't waste your time and your money on such a futile project. And these four young men, bright and all as they were, educated as they were, they had no problem with accepting the fact that human knowledge has its limits. And that were it not for the divine revelation, God shining the light of his truth into our world and into our lives, we would all still be in total spiritual, mental and moral darkness. These wise men are no different from their counterparts in the scientific and political world of our day. Men who seek honor for themselves by claiming certainty when the certainty that they claim is pretty tenuous and fragile. You know, it's, it's frightening as we enter not simply an um, a election year in, in Great Britain, um, but an election year in the United States and other major elections will be taking in different parts of the world and those who are running for office speak boldly and confidently about what they will do and what they know and what they understand. But the truth of the matter is that many of them are just flying by the seat of their pants. That they're responding to situations as they arise, hoping that they will get the right, make the right judgment call in the decisions that they make. 
But the Bible asserts with certainty, the kind of certainty for which man can claim no credit, but it does so in a way that allows the assertions of God's word to be tested and demonstrated to be both reliable and trustworthy in every respect. Last question that comes out in this mental struggle that Nebuchadnezzar goes through is, is what am I to make of history? Not least as this, as this, as this king in this extraordinary position of power um, was, was deeply conscious, not simply of what was past history, but what was future history. Uh, he, had, he had made plans, he had, he had, he had embarked on conquests, and, and thus far he had been successful, but he knew only too well that one thing that is common to every empire is that it will have its day. Empires not only rise, every empire falls. Even the great British Empire that encircled the world at one stage eventually crumbled from within. Not to a foreign army, but it just destroyed itself from within. So at this point in the episode, two things happen. First of all, Daniel, Daniel is able to relate the, the dream exactly as it happened, verses 29 to 35. But then he goes on in verses 36 to 45 to explain precisely what it meant. And, and, and here's, here's the crunch of what this chapter is all about. Uh, the, the, the sequence is significant because the precision of the first element, uh, which astounded the king, namely the, the <coughs> descriptions of the different parts of this, this image and, and, and what it was made up of, is reinforced um, credibly by the second element. This king who had every reason to believe that a god who could read his mind would be well able to forecast and interpret history. Um, he, 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 had been, he had been troubled, not just by the dream, but he had been troubled by the fact that actually there's a God in heaven who does know what's going on in his head and who does know the deepest fears of his heart. That such a God is surely to be revered and taken seriously. The precision and the detail of the political forecasts are so accurate in this passage, so glaringly accurate that many liberal biblical scholars say this simply proves that Daniel was written after the event. This was written at a much later stage of ancient history than the, de the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It is too accurate to have come from the lips of any human being. Of course, the answer to that is, well, it didn't come from the lips of any human being. It came from the lips of God. God was doing the speaking. God was doing the, revel the revealing. And, of course, the reason why such liberal scholars respond in that way is that they, at heart, in their hearts, they can't accept the existence of such a God. The God that they worship is a God that they've manufactured for themselves, a God of their own imagination, not the God of the universe, and the God of Holy Scripture, but one that they've invented for themselves. Clearly, both the elements in what Daniel had said had a ring of truth as far as Nebuchadnezzar is concerned, and, and he acknowledged it in verses 46 to 49. He, he realized this, um, and, and, um, and, and, and Daniel simply brings home to, to Nebuchadnezzar the fact that the God of the Bible can make sense of history for one simple reason. He is the Lord of history, and he controls the course that it follows. And the ultimate proof of that, and this is where the crunch comes for us, dear friends, the crunch that is, is, is found in the most significant detail in this dream and the explanation that is given to it. Look again at verses and 34 and 35 um, in, that, in, the, in the passage. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze, the silver and the gold, all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. What does this mean? Look at verses 44 and 45. 
Uh, Daniel goes on to say, And in those days, uh, the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut out of a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation is secure. That, my friends, is widely accepted and acknowledged. And indeed, it's, it's self-evident from the text that in the midst of human empires and human kingdoms, there would come a kingdom that originates from another world. That's why in the Bible it's called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's the rule of God in the midst of those who bear his image on this earth. But further than that, it's the rule of God that extends savingly throughout the entire world and universe, ultimately. So the big question is not merely did the prophecy about the world empires prove true, which they did. They did. The Macedonian Empire. The Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, all the empires that are identified specifically in these parts of the statue and later in the dreams of Daniel, all those, those empires came and they fell. And they're now consigned to the pages of ancient history. But there is another kingdom of which the Bible speaks clearly, and it's the kingdom of heaven, it's the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom that was recognized at the birth of Christ. That, that the wise men who came from the east came to worship a baby? No, they came to worship a king. The one who was born king of the Jews. The one who came to this world to usher in the kingdom that God had promised from the very beginning. It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And we all know that that Prophecy has not only been fulfilled in that Christ has come and he has ushered in his kingdom, but that he is continuing to fulfill that prophecy as his kingdom spreads north, south, east and west, as the church throughout the world prays, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every day that prayer is being answered. Every time an individual turns in faith and repentance to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and for salvation, that prayer is being answered because as soon as they pray, Lord, save me, they are being incorporated into the kingdom and brought under the lordship of King Jesus. And when we realize that, we're able to work, sing the words of that well-known Christmas carols with the little town of Bethlehem. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It wasn't just the fate of little Israel that was being determined that night that Jesus was born. It was the fate of the world that was being determined that night the king came. In one sense, it's good to see someone like Douglas Adams, atheist though he was, trying to make sense of the history of this world, the meaning of the universe. It's the big questions that are sadly not being asked in our day at all. We've given up on the big questions of life for our generation. It's good to ask those big questions and, res and wrestle with them. But in doing so, we need to acknowledge the limits of our finite, fallen human understanding. And grasp the fact that were it not for the fact God has given us the light of his word to shine into the darkness of our understanding, we would still be groping in the dark. And as far as any of us might be concerned, if we didn't have that light, trying to find answers for ourselves, then the meaning of life, the answer to the big question, may be 42, but we know it's not. Let's pray. Lord God, in this day of intellectual and moral and
personal confusion in so many parts of the world, so many spheres of life. We beg you, O Lord, to shine the light of your truth afresh into this world, into this province of ours, and to awaken a new generation to seek you, to find you, and to discover the safety and security that you alone provide in your kingdom, the kingdom that is the kingdom of Christ, your Son and our Saviour. For in his name we pray. Amen.